Right. Well, kia ora koutou ko, Victoria McLennan toko ingoa, but please call me Vic. And welcome to the first of our Lunch and Learn series that we're going to have for IT professionals over the summer. Today, I'm very lucky to have fabulous Jake has joined me to talk all about insurance. So first of all, welcome, Jake. Thanks for joining. Hi, no worries. Thanks for attending. Um, so for everyone on this webinar, it is a webinar, we are recording it, so it will be available to you to watch and share with your colleagues later on. Um, you are able to ask questions via the Q&A function, and I, as I said, I'm on my own today. Um, Crispy and Dan from ITP are off, and their band Darts is off in Australia. They've been invited to South by Southwest Sydney, so they're over there playing in a band so I haven't got either of them to help me with this webinar today so just be patient while I monitor the Q&A and I'll ask Jake questions during the session. So Jake do you want to um, kick us off by introducing yourself tell us a bit about what you do and I know because you're an insurance person you'll have some disclaimers that you need to make as well so over to you. Yeah so uh, look uh, my name's Jake I, I work up here in our uh, Auckland CBD office um, I've got a bit of a, a dual role. Um, I am technically working for Rothbury Insurance Brokers, um, but we have a subsidiary called um, Target Insurance. Now, um, I'm a, a qualified insurance broker, um, so with that, I do just have to uh, make a, a pretty clear um, black and white disclosure here. So under the Target Insurance brand, which administers the um, the IT professional's product, uh, it is a non-advice arm of Rothbury, so we don't administer any uh, what we call regulated financial advice. So that's no advice around acquiring or disposing of a financial product, i.e. insurance. Um, that's not to mean the hard work hasn't been done in the background to make sure the product isn't suitable. Um, yeah, so I do just have to uh, speak very frankly and, and, and quite bland today, unfortunately. Um, and you may see me looking for some specific words uh, in the policy wording just to make sure that there's no crossing of that line. So, yeah, um, that's that's a bit about me and um, where the product sits. Thank you. I find it fascinating every time I talk to anyone who works in your industry, all the and of financial advisors as well, right? All of the disclaimers that they mm. need to make around what hat and what they're able to say or not say. Exactly. So it's great yeah. that, that we, the consumer, get all those protections, right? Absolutely. So well, let's start off in some general terms. And can you give us a bit of an overview and tell us what professional liability public liability and statutory liability insurances are. Absolutely. So um, I'll start off by just saying, so those three products form um, what we administer uh, through through the members as their technology, um, technology liability. So with professional indemnity, this is essentially a cover for any wrongful act. So um, errors or omissions um, from yourself in the course of providing your technology product or technology service. Um, now, if something goes wrong and, and there's a claim from your client against you, um, this could be a, a court, uh, something settled in court, um, or damages payable, this insurance covers you for uh, the damages, so non-physical, um, so it could be reparations, fines, uh, things like that, as well as the court costs associated uh, to defend that claim. Um, it's to put into layman's terms, it's saying uh, you've said your product or service will do something and it doesn't do that thing and there's uh, damages uh, for that advice or, or product. Uh, with public liability, now if you ever see general liability, public and general are the same thing. Uh, that is when we get into the physical realm now of damage to a third party's property. So physical damage to their, to their property. That could be as simple as going in to meet your client in their offices for a meeting and you've abs accidentally damaged something. Um, yeah, that, that's, where that, that's where that falls. And then we've got statutory liability, which is the unintentional breach of any government act. Now, uh, I won't go into a list of all the acts. There, there's, there's dozens of them, um, but it could quite simply be Consumer Guarantees Act or, or Fair Trading Act. Now, uh, those acts in breach come with a fine, um, quite hefty sometimes, 
uh, and the court costs to defend those um, claims is also included in the insurance. So um, there's just been a, a latest uh, update of the fines, I think, last year, and some of them have doubled uh, or even tripled. So you could be looking at fifty, hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars in fines um, just for the breach of that act unintentionally. So it can be quite an expensive mistake. Yeah, and I guess people unintentionally breach legislation or regulations if they don't know about them, right? Sure. So, yeah. so having that cover sounds like it's really important. And those have been, you were saying, in the ITP context, which you're going to talk a little bit more about in a minute, they've been bundled together into one package. Is that the usual thing that happens, that they get bundled together? Absolutely. So um, within the ITP package, uh, they're all there because they just work in harmony together, um, and you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't operate a business in the generic sense without those types of covers. There will be businesses that don't need, um, let's say, professional indemnity, um, but I would say almost all businesses should operate general and statutory liability. Right. So I guess that leads into my next question of who should hold these insurances and why? Yeah, so I'll, I'll get a bit specific here. Um, okay. and I'll, talk, I'll talk about the ITP um, product. So for these, um, and I will read the words, sorry, guys. Um, so long story short, this product is quite specific for its business descriptions and, and, and services. Uh, so we've got here any information and communications uh, technology contracting services. Uh, any ICT project management uh, or any IT business analysis. Uh, analysis. Um, now, those three criteria have been set as they cover quite a broad spectrum. Um, there will be businesses within those uh, that are excluded, but there will also be a few businesses outside of that description that will be included. So what we've got there is... Um, uh, proposal form so when we go through the fact we ask a few more questions and we decide which business and their dis business description fits within that product but generally speaking all independent contractors should hold insurance if they're yes, absolutely. contracting yeah. and then and then what you're saying all businesses no matter how small they are whether they've got one employee or two they should also hold that insurance yeah so any business operating Theoretically, yes, should hold hold um, liability insurance. And I know I'm going off script a little bit. And I'm going to ask you a question you may not be able to answer. But in New Zealand, generally, do you know what the uptake of insurance is? Like, are we a well-insured country? Or do people uh, just kind of operate being in the she'll be right way and not take insurance when they should? Great, great question. Um, I would like to think it's 100%. Um, it's obviously <laughs> not. Um, uh, yeah, I would say it's up there. The reason I say that is a lot of businesses require lending or financing through whether it be a bank or a third party and contractually you have to have insurance, um, to put in simple terms, if you're borrowing money, the bank wants to know if it all goes wrong, it's going to come back. So in that sense, I'd say, let's call it 90, 95% fingers crossed. Right. That's pretty good. We're pretty good at doing the things we're meant to do in New Zealand generally, aren't we? Like, I think as citizens. We're... Yeah, you'd, ho you'd hope so. Um, yeah, there <laughs> are a few cowboys, but um, look, it, it is what it is. You'll always get that. Yeah. So just let's talk a little bit more about the ITP group scheme. Can you just tell us a bit about what group schemes are, I guess, and how they operate and, um, and anything else that anyone's listening might be interested in knowing to consider joining this one yeah absolutely so in the broad sense uh when we talk about a scheme product it's essentially the collection of, of individuals or businesses who have a, a common need um who are bunched together usually at a common renewal date um throughout the year and essentially what we do is we take rather than one business to an insurer to underwrite them specifically we take 100, 200, 1,000, all with the same need. Uh, and then we can go, right, if you're going to offer $1,000 for this person, 
for their business, why don't we offer 500 for a thousand of their businesses? Um, so it's a it's a way of buying product at wholesale, essentially. Um, obviously, there's, there's some margin for profit in there for the insurers, um, but it's it's like going to the supermarket and buying 100 lettuces or or going to Gilmore's or whatever the wholesale um, retailers are where you get a discount for buying in bulk. Um, so what we've done there is essentially we've gone to the market, we've explored the key uh, underwriters in this space, and for those who have appetite, actually taking a step back there, there's been an interesting change in the past 12 to 18 months with insurers' appetite. Uh, we're seeing a lot more declinatures and a lot more refining of what they actually want to be on risk for. Um, this was worsened by the January and February floods. I think we're up at about $4 billion worth of losses in the industry this year so far um, compared to, I think, around the $1 to $1.5 billion uh, for the past few years. Um, now, those losses, whether it's uh, a physical loss through the form of a building being damaged or um, a vehicle, or whatever insurance you hold, regardless, the losses are passed down to the client. So at the moment, none of the IT contractors have any physical insurance, so any um, insurance for computers or anything like that, but the losses are still being passed down to the liability aspect just as a way of spreading the risk for the insurers. Um, so because of that, we, uh, we're well aware that we're going to be going to market to make sure that this product is still suitable, it's still in the best place, um, and the insurer still has appetite for it too, which is the main thing. And are group schemes quite common or are they um, kind of a, an unusual byproduct of the of this whole business insurance world? Yeah, it's it's a really good question actually. Um, it depends on it depends who you get and it, and it depends why there's a collection of of businesses. So, uh, for example, you could have an association like um, ITP go right. We've we've got X amount of members. We need to we want to offer them something special. Perfect. Let's do it. Um, we can if we can collect enough information to put a proposal forward to the insurers. Usually they'll accept it. Um, then on the other hand, you could have a franchise group of two hundred franchisees doing whatever they do, um, going right. We pay thousand dollars for insurance. We want to offer our franchisees some savings uh, those ones can get a little bit more complicated because the insurer wants a specific percent of uptake um, so yes they are common um, and they can be implemented specifically uh, at, at, at the drop of a hat I could go find a group of plumbers somewhere and put something in place for them um, but it does help it does help when there's they're all um, individually owned and operated, they can make their own decisions. Um, so they don't have to join the scheme specifically. However, there are absolutely a raft of benefits to, to, to join a scheme. Nice. So we've talked about the bundling into, you know, that the scheme offers around the technology liability insurance. Are there other types of insurances that people who are independent contractors or small businesses should be buying as well? Yeah, absolutely. So um, any small business, there would be probably four or five things you'd look at um, specifically. Um, so we've mentioned the ones um, included in the, in the technology package. Outside of the target realm, um, I'd say a contractor should be looking at physical protection of, of its assets. Um, so that could be uh, vehicles, um, laptops, desks, any content sort of thing. Uh, it's important to make the, dis the distinction between household contents and business contents. So um, taking a look at that from a different lens um, and making sure that regardless of whether they're uh, domestic or business contents, um, that they're insured. Um, and lastly, it's not something that uh, I want to get into too deeply, but income protection for contractors is a very important insurance um it's something that i personally don't don't issue but we've got a lot of business partners um throughout new zealand that specialize in that sort of insurance so essentially the the theory there is um if the wheels stop moving on your business and the money stops flowing in 
as a contractor, are you going to be able to continue um, continue living your life? So that's that's a very important insurance uh, that we probably don't see enough uptake of in the market. I'm only loosely associated with it, um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's not not the biggest. Uh, and that's a that's a fascinating one, isn't it? Because if you think about Kaikoura earthquake, and for those of us in Wellington, couldn't return to our buildings and therefore couldn't return to work for quite a period of time. And then, of course, COVID, where many um, many businesses stood their contractors down while they were figuring out what the impacts of COVID were going to be on their on their business. So I guess then, you know, those are two really recent big events that that income protection insurance would have been beneficial for contractors, wouldn't it? Yeah, there is a bit of distinction there. Um, for income protection, it's more around the physical injury or illness. So okay, and, and unfortunately, um, COVID was one of those things where there was no insurance anywhere that would have helped anyone. Um, the, the phone didn't stop ringing to try and find solutions, but uh, it was an unfortunate conversation that we've had to have many a time that uh, it's just a general exclusion. And unfortunately, sometimes insurance is seen as the way out. Um, we're right. not always the way out. Um, not everything is insurable. And I guess in that case, the government became the underwriter with True, their yeah. scheme, right? So yeah. they protected everyone who was independent or small business from being able to pay themselves or their employees during that time. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, you've touched a little bit on some of the conditions in recent like weather events that are impacting the insurance space here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is there is there more you can kind of comment on more broadly about the insurance space here in our country? We're at the arse end of the world, and you wonder whether insurers are really interested in us. Um, got yeah, any other thoughts there? It's it's uh, how how long do you have? Um, <laughs> it's it's one of those things that was on everyone's radar prior to um, the floods uh, this year, but it was never really a concern. So we've got a a large number of um, Australian underwriters in New Zealand, and we've got very few that are solely New Zealand-based. On top of that, we're now seeing the introduction of more um, underwriting agencies, which um serve London or Singapore um, insurers. So they're basically homes in New Zealand that have access to the London or Singapore market. Um, through the through the weather events of January, February, I went on leave in June and everything was fine. Um, it was one of those things where you go, oh right, it, it's it's quite a disaster. There's money being paid up and no one really knew the extent. I went on leave in June. I came back uh, four to six weeks later and it's like I didn't know anything. Uh, the market had just done a complete 180. What you would have thought would have been a simple five-minute job was now took two weeks. Um, we're seeing uh, all insurers are, are understaffed. Um, the, the times are just ridiculous to do anything. The appetite has well and truly changed cherry picking. Um, so insurers have their set appetite and what they want to write and what they think they're good at and, and they know, and they'll take that and nothing else these days. Uh, it used to be a bit of a, uh, right, uh, insurer, can you write this for this, yes or no? Now it's a, uh, a matter of, hey, do you want to do this? Um, can you even get insurance on this, yes or no, first? And then we talk about the pricing and the terms. So it's a completely different world to what it was uh, even at the start of this year. Um, yeah, it was. It's it's a wake up call for insurance, and I think New Zealanders as a whole see insurance slightly as a right, and that I'll just get insurance on it. It's fine. That's no longer the case anymore. Um, you'll start to notice your home contents and vehicle insurance probably um, go up fifty percent. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't actually blink an eye if, if you're going 50% at the moment. It's not uncommon. Um, we're seeing minimum 20 to 30 um, just every day. So the world around insurance has really changed. And I think that's actually another benefit of being in a scheme. You've got a premium pool, not of just your premium that you're paying. 
you've got the other hundred or the other thousand people in that pool offsetting any losses that are measured against your uh, industry or occupation. So in the realm of, of ITP specifically, you know, you've got a very, um, a very solidly, solidly performing account um, where the losses are few and far between. And we have such a good argument to keep the pricing flat or, or very, very minimal um, when we're talking increases. So the insurance market as a whole is changing and, and it's incredibly volatile, but that's where the schemes and, and the group pricing uh, strategy really shows its own. Oh, that's really good to know. And I guess when you were talking, it was making me think, you know, there are people who live in flood areas with house insurance and coastal erosion that are going to start to be impacted, but it probably also will impact like business interruption insurance and other types of insurance as well now, won't it? Absolutely. It'll be, it's essentially, um, subs- it's, it's subsidy from, from X to Y. Um, so you've got someone on top of a cliff where they can, they'd never be able to get flooded, but they're subsidizing someone at the bottom of the cliff um, and they're meeting in the middle somewhere. So it's yeah. it's a big transfer of risk throughout the country. Um, like Auckland paid for Christchurch mainly back in the day. Now the rest of the country is paying for Auckland. So it's one of those things, if we have another disastrous year like we did, you'll likely see insurers either pull out of New Zealand in, uh, in its entirety or like they do in Australia with um, fire and hailstorm, you're either covered or not covered. And, and to... To be covered could cost you twenty thousand dollars on your home insurance policy, just for hail, just for hail cover. Um, so we're either going to really, really pay for it, or it's not going to be available. Wow, that'll, that, wow. that'll be the future of New Zealand insurance. Yeah, that's fascinating, eh? So there's a few questions on the Q and A. Um, a couple of them are quite specific, but I'll I'll make them a little bit more generic, okay? So the first one was around insurance insurance options available or suggested for a company with major overseas clients. And then they go into specifically asking about um, US banks and fintech as customers. So for the insurance we've been talking about, so for the ITP scheme, can you just talk to what jurisdiction that does cover and if someone was based here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but has offshore clients, are they covered by that? Or is there another kind of insurance that they need to be looking at? Well, if, if there were three red flags, you could have raised, you, you've raised all three. Um, <laughs> so the so USA, uh, so Northern America, uh, including Canada, uh, completely not covered by this policy um, and almost not covered by a lot of policies. Um, you'd probably seen if you had a hundred of them, ninety nine percent of them would not cover Northern America. Wow. You can um, opt to include it. It is is a very expensive cover um, when you're talking in the fintech uh, banking sector. So you can, you can get the cover. Don't get me wrong. Um, there will be a uh, an avalanche of information that's needed. Um, so don't turn to this product for that solution. I don't believe. Um, unless we've specifically referred it elsewhere and that's already been accepted. Um, in the general sense, that's not what this product is for. And is that because the US is such a litigious society? Right. Yeah. Um, right. It's, yeah, the the way it works compared to New Zealand is completely different. Um, so that could be one that um, maybe preferred to be underwritten by a London underwriter or, or a Singapore underwriter when they've got right. exposure um, internationally. However, completely insurable uh, if we have the right information. And for other jurisdictions, not talking about the US, is it, it, does this, the cover that we've been talking about, does that just cover New Zealand as a jurisdiction? Or if I was doing business in Australia, would I be covered for that? Or would I need specialist insurance for other jurisdictions? Usually it's a simple question of, hey, where do you want cover? If you want cover more than Australia, usually we just go to a um, worldwide, uh, excluding Northern America. So as soon as you ask for worldwide cover, they come back with worldwide excluding um, NA. So it's 
it's it's not uncommon. It's not um, difficult to put in place. There may be some regu regulatory requirements that need um, settling, but at the end of the day, it's it's not too much of a um, big job to get that cover in place. Again, I don't believe this product is where you'd find the answer for that, um, but it's not difficult to to underwrite as a um, uh, in a broken world. Cool. And then the next question is very specific. Would someone get a bit of rate from you if they're only insured with Delta for 15 million with layering? So I guess that just leads to me asking the question of how do people get hold of you if they're wanting to ask you those specific questions? Yeah, so um, in terms of spe spe specific questions, um, look, we can dive into that. It'll either be myself or we've got um, another broker, uh, Christine, who, who does um, get all the referrals. Um, for all of this. However, we can work in unison and come up with an answer uh, to make sure that the uh, your cover is correctly placed. So I might even pass on my details um, to Vic if that's okay to, to yeah. distribute, is it, if that's all right. Perfect. Um, yep. And we that can have a look great. at specific situations outside of target insurance and then we can get it um, a bit more um, creative with our solutions. Great. The next question is a really interesting one and it's one that I've often wondered um, basically, they've said, is there any chance of locking in insurance for a few years, much like we do with mortgages? And I have always wondered why with insurances for my many businesses I'm involved with, it needs you need to reapply every year and go through the same big, long questionnaires and, and everything every year. So tell us what that's all about. That's actually a really, really good question. Um, and one that is, uh, it's actually been topical. So we, I'm, I'm going to relate it to um, something else first and kind of bring it back. So uh, we have um, a scheme for body corporates in our, in our broking world. And body corporates, because they're governed uh, by a committee and uh, at an AGM and there's a majority and things like that, usually bottom dollar is the drive. And bottom dollar isn't necessarily the best thing when talking insurance. You're either you're usually missing out on something. But because of the nature of the beast, uh, it's a race to the bottom. The insurers are now pulling out of the market for that, for body corporates, uh, or we're slowly seeing um, excesses or, or conditions imposed that are just ridiculous. So now we're going, right, instead of a 12-month, can we guarantee a three-year contract with a body with an insurer so that the uh, insurer can offset losses guaranteed for three years. Now, that is something we're looking at very closely. Um, I think it's the answer for a lot of industries. For this type of industry, I don't believe it to be the answer, um, just because the claims aren't as thick and fast as they are with physical property. Um, you're talking about professionals who do their job and do their job well. Um, so we see we see a lot less claims in this space, and I don't think um, it would be the answer. Although I think if you request, if we requested, I don't see why we couldn't. Um, yeah, it's a very good question though. Um, uh, for for those volatile industries where there's <laughs> claims every year, I think there needs to be a claims loss ratio assessment to reprice. Right. Um, yeah, that that's the short answer. Yeah. I just always wonder if it's just information mm. farming. But anyway. I promise okay. you I love all the paperwork. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's a necessary evil way. Correct. Um, okay. Next question is if you're starting out as a consultant and you've got no clients and maybe 50K in the bank account, will insurance um, will, will insurance companies cover you if you've got no track record? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, you've got to get insurance somehow. Um, and just because you're a new business with no track rec track record um, doesn't go against you. Um, I think there is a question in here in the proposal form, how long have you been operating as a, as a contractor? Um, it's not a referral trigger if it's less than a year. It's, it's, it's not um, deemed as a, a, a negative. Um, that comes back to the 12 month contract of, right, you're a new contractor. How'd you go in your first 12 months? Oh, it was horrible. We had $150,000 worth of losses. Right, okay, we need to reprice you. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the theory involved in that, but absolutely no drama. Right, oh, that's good to know. The next question is about privacy breaches. Are there any insurance, is there any insurance that covers you in case of a privacy breach? 
And they go on to say, we don't have any clients in European countries. Um, again, uh, getting... There was a reshape around the Privacy Act just recently. Um, I'd have to get back to you with a bit more information on that offline, I think. But yep. in theory, that's what uh, the statutory liability uh, policy yeah. should respond to. Um, however, there was something that I just don't know the specifics on off the top of my head. So um, I'll, I might have to come back to you on that one. Yeah, that'd be really useful if you could yeah. just send me a note and I'll send it out to everyone who registered for the Absolutely. webinar. So that's the end of our questions, except we have one last question, which is asking if you can re-summarise what the um, the three and the PIPL and SL, the three insurance types, were at the end of the session again. Um, so if before we do that, is there anything else you think I haven't asked you that we need to tell people? Uh, no, look, I think. Um... We've covered everything. Uh, I think as a scheme, this is a, uh, for the members, this is the way that we're looking at it. We want to get the, co the cost point down for this as much as we can. And the more uptake we have, the, the cheaper it gets for everyone. So we will send out, um, or we've got a form, I think, um, available on the ITP website. If you're coming up for renewal and you just want to have a look at things, please go through the process and just see where we are. Um, the more on it, the cheaper it gets um, each year, theoretically. Um, so, yeah, please keep us in mind if you're wanting to review things um, or if you have any specific questions, obviously, um, we can take something offline and look at it in a broken space. Yeah, I've had a few members contact me once we put this webinar up and tell me how great the insurance has been for them over the years and how the membership fees for ITP has offset what they've saved with their insurance. So... No, no promises or guarantees that's going to be the case for everyone, but for some people it obviously has been. Um, so that was really good to hear because I yeah, that, really heard that is much. Nice. <laughs> it won't roll as smoothly 100% of the time, um, but we've got, an, <laughs> got that on, online form. So there's nothing to physically print or sign like um, a, a lot of nice. the old school stuff does. So, yeah, keep us in mind. So can you summarise for us again what that... Um, what were the three again? They were statutory um, liability, public liability, and professional, um, indemnity. professional indemnity. Yeah. So just want to summary on what those do? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So um, professional indemnity. So that's, again, uh, the cover for uh, any wrongful acts or any errors or omissions um, as your duty as a contractor. Um, so that could be uh, essentially you're saying your product or your service and you're sorry, your technology product or your technology service is going to do something and it doesn't do that. Um, so that could be your client coming to you, I'm going to write, we're going to take you to court. You're just, you, you're, you've, um, uh, you've breached the contract due to X, Y, and Z. Um, we're going to fine you or um, sue you or whatever it may be. Or there could be uh, additional reparation of water from the judge. Uh, so that's what that covers. Um, that's uh, essential uh, in the operation of, of the business, I think. Um, then we've got public liability, which is the uh, damage, physical damage to a third party's property. Uh, again, so that could be going into the office and accidentally damaging something uh, while you're there. Um, and then statutory liability is the unintentional breach of government acts. Um, and I think the examples I used for that were consumer guarantees or, or fair trading act. Um, I know those two have just had a bit of an uplift in their fines, but funnily enough, with sorry, with professional indemnity and statutory liability, it also covers the court costs to defend yourself. These can almost be more, if not on par with the fine. So um, look, <laughs> lawyers aren't cheap. Um, they charge by the six minute slot and it's not going down. So uh, that can almost sometimes exceed the fine. Yeah, I've experienced lawyers' fees a few times in the past and they are horrendously scary when, yeah. you, when you uncover what they do. Um, on that public liability, I might be going off on a tangent here, but what about for people, does that cover if you're subcontract, uh, sorry, if you're leasing a desk in a co-working space and you Absolutely. cause damage there, right, because that might be relevant for people who are contractors, right? 
Absolutely. So as soon as you're um, in contact with another person's property, uh, that's right. when it will come into its own. Vehicle, uh, if you're driving a vehicle and you abs- accidentally damage someone else's property, that's covered under the vehicle insurance. Completely right. separate there. So. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for your time today. That's been fascinating. I think people would have found this really, really useful and interesting. And obviously we had lots of questions and thank you for being able to tack- tackling all of those. And any um, follow-up info that Jake sends me, I'll send out to everyone who attended, the who signed up for this webinar. Um, really appreciate you doing our first lunch and learn, Jake. That was awesome. great. No, thanks, everyone. And we'll say kakite and goodbye to everyone. Hope you have a great day. Kakite. See you guys.